those of you that uh, went to the ISTH in Geneva, I don't know how many of you were there or had an opportunity to go, but I had the opportunity, I think, on the only sunny day that week, because it poured the entire week of the ISTH, got to go up to Mont Blanc. Uh, and it was a fabulous uh, experience to go up to the top of Mont Blanc. So hopefully we'll give you a mountaintop experience here talking about thrombophilia testing. <laughs> So for this audience, I really don't have to give this introduction, I'm sure, but to look at some of the factors that play into the development um, of a, a thrombus, if you will, or in the development of a hemostatic plug, we go to the, the vascular wall. And the blood vessels, of course, are lined by endothelial cells. And if there's any endothelial damage, we'll have exposure of extracellular matrix proteins that Kennedy talked about um, in his platelet talk uh, the, the last hour. Uh, that would be responsible for activating adhering platelets, et cetera. We also get exposure of procoagulants, uh, largely tissue factor. Uh, it's extrinsic typically to the blood vessel expressed on smooth muscle cells, fibroblasts. When you have vascular injury, this of course gets exposed. The platelets adhere very rapidly uh, to the extracellular matrix proteins. Platelets are coated with hundreds of thousands of different receptors that bind to everything from von Willebrand's factor to collagen to thrombospondin to fibronectin. Exposure of the tissue factor then leads to a cascade of events that we'll talk about briefly, but ultimately leading in the formation of thrombin. What we're most interested in talking about thrombophilia, though, is how this whole process is regulated. What are the inhibitors of this process? And we'll talk a bit about tissue factor pathway inhibitor, uh, protein C and protein S, as well as antithrombin, an immediate acting inhibitor of thrombin. Thrombin, of course, then converts fibrinogen to fibrin, leading to a fibrin uh, clot. And as Kennedy also mentioned, fibrinogen also becomes the glue that holds the platelets together as platelets activate. Thrombin, another interaction between coagulation and platelets, thrombin of course activates the thrombin receptors, the PAR receptors on platelet surfaces leading directly to plate, further platelet activation. And, and with the fibrinogen bridge then leads to a platelet thrombus. So if we're talking about thrombophilia, which essentially is the wrong amount of clot at the wrong time in the wrong place. It's a dysregulation of this physiologic process that we'll be talking about. And of course, uh, the fibrinolytic system, which you heard Wayne Chandler talk about yesterday, plays maybe more of a minor role in the development of risk factors for thrombophilia, but the fibrinolytic system is, is available and activated once the clot forms uh, to work to de degrade the clot uh, and resolve the thrombus. I think of hemostasis as a tightrope or a teeter-totter, and we all walk it every day of our life from excess bleeding to excess thrombosis. And if we're all in proper balance, a balance between the vascular wall cells, the plasma proteins um, in the plasma, and platelets keeps the procoagulant and regulatory elements of the hemostatic system in balance. There are several different ways you can have an imbalance of this hemostatic system that lead to thrombosis, one of which is increased amounts of the procoagulant factors. And if you look at the procoagulant factors going back to the coagulation cascade, the ones that have a gray box around them are ones that have had some description of either increased activity or increased levels of these proteins being associated with a risk for thrombosis. The two that we'll spend some time talking about are abnormalities of factor V, such as factor V Leiden, and abnormalities of prothrombin uh, or thrombin uh, that also can be risk factors for thrombosis. Variously uh, elevated levels of factor VIII and factor XI have been reported as thrombophilic risk. There have been some genetic mutations that I won't talk about further with factor VII that have had variable associations with actually some decreased thrombotic risk. Likewise, the, uh, the mutations of factor XIII have been associated with uh, changes in thrombotic risk as well. And some level reports uh, linking high levels of fibrinogen more really with arterial than venous thrombosis. 
and some mutations of those associated with thrombophilia as well. And those I, I won't spend a lot of time going into because uh, they're really not recommended in terms of the general laboratory armamentarium. But these are gain of function abnormalities that we're talking about. One of the first ones I'd like to just mention is the protein C, protein S, and the uh, factor V uh, system. And the story starts really with the endothelial cells. Endothelial cells, of course, line all of your blood vessels. And one of the proteins expressed on the surface of endothelial cells called thrombomodulin, here listed as TM. Thrombomodulin is and does what its name implies. It modulates the activity of thrombin. And thrombin, as you, we, we're all aware, is a procoagulant enzyme. It converts fibrinogen to fibrin. It's the main enzyme, really, in the coagulation uh, system that is very closely and tightly regulated uh, by the body. Thrombin, when bound to thrombomodulin, does something unusual. And that, that's what thrombomodulin means. It modulates the activity of thrombin. It's, it changes the substrate specificity of thrombin from converting fibrinogen to fibrin uh, to converting protein C to activated protein C. In essence, it turns thrombin from a procoagulant molecule to an anticoagulant molecule. And activated protein C together with its cofactor protein S is a protease that works on degrading coagulation factors. Uh, not only factor V as, as I've got shown on the slide here, but factor VIII as well. And protein C essentially enzymatically clips of uh, these proteins at different arginine groups. And it does so initially, the first cleavage site is arginine 506, followed by 306, and then 679 in that order. So really, the first cleavage site of 506 decreases the majority of the activity of factor V. And that leads to an inactivated factor V. And as we'll talk about, mutations at the arginine 506 level described to be factor V latent um, are responsible for uh, what I would call an energizer bunny uh, mutation of factor V because the, if you mutate this arginine 506 to glutamine, protein C can't clip factor V, can't decrease its activity, and factor V keeps going and going and going as a, a, essentially a procoagulant uh, molecule. The factor V Leiden, you're all probably aware of this is a single point mutation um, in the factor V gene resulting in an arginine 506 to glutamine substitution. The mutant protein has prolonged procoagulant activity, so it keeps going and going and going. It isn't easily regulated by protein C. So the frequency of this mutation is about 5% in the Caucasian population. It really is the most common genetic uh, risk factor for thrombosis in the Caucasian population. And if you look at uh, studies that look just at, at family-related thrombophilia, you can find it in upwards of 40% of patients that have well-documented familial thrombophilia, or about 20% of all patients with well-documented DVT, especially those at a younger age. Interestingly, it gives a relatively mild increased risk. So your risk uh, of having thrombosis compared to someone without factor V Leiden is about threefold. If you're a homozygote, if you've got two abnormal copies of the gene and all of your factor V is mutated, your risk can go up to about 80-fold. 